Here comes Jeff. He's, uh, he's Good evening. Welcome to the January 17th Board of Adjustment meeting. My name is Phyllis Eldridge and I'm the new chair of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Due to the large number of agenda items submitted for tonight's meeting, I would like to propose splitting the agenda and postponing new business items E through I to next Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Is so there a moved. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a motion to that effect? Second. Okay. All in favor? Do I need a roll call for this? Um, we can do a roll call. Yeah. Okay. Roll call. Um, Mr. Mannell? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Ms. Margerson? Yes. Ms. Mr. Ruham? Uh, yes. And Mr. Rossi? Yep. And Mr. Matson? Yes. And the chair votes, votes yes. So we will be seeing each other again on January 24th. Let me all move down. I would like to ask the board to consider taking item 2C out of order to postpone consideration to the March 21st, 2023 meeting at the request of the applicant. That is the request of 635 Sagamore Development LLC for property located at 635 Sagamore Avenue. Make a motion to uh, postpone it to our March, March 21st meeting. meeting. Yeah. Is there oh, a second? Well, point of order, Madam Chair. Oh, uh, your first motion is to take it out of order, I believe. I would move so, to take thank it out. You. Thank I would you. move to take it out of order. Is there a second to take it out of order? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So now this next motion is to postpone it. The request to postpone until the March 21st, 2023 so meeting. Okay, Mr. Mannell, a second. So moved. I'll second. Chair, one. Yes. May I, may I ask a question? Is there no speaking opportunity based on uh, the request for a postponement? No, there is not. There's no. It's not a even public meeting. This, even though this has happened before, even you have the right number of voting folks to go through it. Even so though this has happened, we explain, don't postpone it. Okay, could you just explain for the group that's here? in opposition, could you explain why they have the right to postpone it? And, and that's, that would probably be okay. This is a little irregular, but I will, I will do this for a minute. Um, every petitioner has the right to postpone. And as far as I understand, I think the postponement was to try to reach some sort of better ground with the um, neighborhood. And since this is allowed, we're going to allow it. And, and I, in, in different, and I, I get the point about the notion that, that we need to respect the applicant, but do the abutters not have the opportunity to ask the board to rule on it? And then if the, if the applicant then needs to come back with a different one, they do. But it just seems like it's, the can is getting kicked down the road. And that may seem that way, but this follows the rules that we work under. So that's the way it's, that's the way it's going to be if the board votes so. Can I step in? No, of course not. Yeah, if, if there is anybody present here that has any questions on how the board proceeds and, and points of order, I'm happy to um, get in touch with you. My name is Stephanie Casella. I'm the staff member. So feel free to reach out to me on staff and I can help explain um, in more detail um, outside of the meeting. So is there a motion to postpone until March 21st? So moved. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mantle. Is there a second? Second. Second? Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, I abstain. I'm going to have to abstain from that vote. Right. I'm recused as well. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, you are. Okay, so. Well, um, Mr. I mean, we get requests to po postpone all the time. Um, and they're routinely, routinely granted simply because it's the applicant, their applicant. Um, 
if they're not ready to have a hearing in front if they're not ready to have the hearing in front of this board and they want to delay it it's up to them it's their petition i mean if they made a request to withdraw they have the opportunity to do that as well so they're making a request to postpone until two months we return routine, routinely grant these no, I'm sorry. Excuse Could, me. This really. No, this is not a public hearing. It isn't sir. a public hearing. No. So. so um, Mr. McDonald, do you have anything to add? I think Mr. Mandel has <clears throat> explained, explained it clearly and sufficiently, and I have nothing to add. Okay. Thank you. All right. We will do a roll call on this. Mr. Mandel. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. And Mr. Matson. Yes. Okay. And the chair votes yes. So this is postponed until March. All right. The next item of business is approval of the minutes of the December 20th, 2022 meeting. Is there any discussion about these? Any corrections? You know, with regard Mr. to the postponement of uh, 635 Sagamore at that meeting, uh, the, right, the minutes incorrectly state that it was a 6-0 vote to postpone, and I abstained right. uh, okay. as a recused member. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other corrections, Mr. Ruin? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on page 14, about the middle of the page, under discussion and decision of the board, the sentence starts, uh, Mr. Ram said there used to be nothing in the zoning board about fence heights uh, change the word board to ordinance there is nothing mm. in these sending ordinance about fence heights other than that the uh, minutes are very complete and uh, detailed I have no further comments okay uh, Miss March oh uh, yes yeah, so on page seven just working backwards page seven uh, the first fill paragraph the second sentence I believe what mr. Ray said that night was he said it went back to the ordinance, which was put together, and I think he said several city councils, not several boards. I will defer to Mr. Ram on that, but I think that's what he said there. And then on page one, uh, former chairman Jim Lee left the board. He he wasn't reappointed. He didn't leave the board. So just a just a correction there. Yeah, just for clarification, I think I said that. It went through the uh, planning board and and the city city council I, I i thought it was close enough but yeah it could it could be clarified to indicate both the planning board and the city council approved the ordinance so if all these corrections are accepted then we will um vote for the amended minutes we'll go the other way mr matson yes mr rossi yes mr Ruham. uh yes uh, sorry and Ms. Margeson? Yes. And Mr. McDonald? Yes. Ms. Mannell? Yes. Mr. Mannell? And the chair votes yes as well. Okay. So the next item of business is the first item of old business, and it's a request by Sherry Holmes and Yvonne Goldsberry of 45 Richmond Street. They request a one-year extension to the variances granted on January 19th. I believe this is because they are having trouble finding a contractor to complete the work, which would have to be done by mid-January. So this is not a public hearing. Okay. Um, this. So. Is there a motion to allow this request? So I, I move to uh, allow the request for uh, extension. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, these are routine requests that we receive uh, when people have difficulties uh, securing a contractor or completing the work. They're within their rights to get a, uh, an extension uh, because it was a timely submission. Uh, within the one year of the original approval uh, and they are entitled to a one year extension therefore i uh, approve or i suggest we approve the uh, the request okay mr matson do you have anything to add i agree it's a reasonable request okay all right <coughs> so we will vote upon oh, this oh, madam chair i'm sorry are we having this point of order do we have discussion 
If you would like to have discussion. Yes, certainly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I will support the motion, although I do want the board to be careful. Um, so we used to have a one year time frame after approval from the board where the applicant was required to get a building permit. That was extended by New Hampshire state law to be two years. Uh, so it used to be one year with a potential one year extension. It's now two years with a potential one year extension. Um, I, would, I would not call it automatic. Um, it is something that the board should consider carefully before allowing uh, an additional time. Understand that the effects of COVID are probably legitimately continuing to be used. January 19th, 2020 was still a, uh, a time frame where uh, there could be concerns about uh, being able to um, compete and for getting a contractor in place because of COVID concerns and other things going on. Um, so I do think it's probably fair to ask for that extension for this particular application. But we should be cautious about it. The applicants have been given that extra year by law. And uh, so giving that third year to me is a little bit more extraordinary. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments? I agree with David, in fact, although I am going to vote for this, because neighborhoods change, things change, and a lot more in two years than one. So, but having said that, um, we will now vote on this. Mr. Yes. 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 Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Margeson. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes as well. So that extension has been allowed. <laughs> okay. Um, item B and old business. Again, there is no public comment. It's not an open not a public meeting for 67 Ridges Court request for rehearing. So, what would we like to do with this? I guess I would like to start by making a comment, which is that uh, I voted to uh, proceed with the hearing when it came before us the last time. Uh, I did not believe at that time that it presented a uh, Fisher versus Dover problem. I still do not believe it presents a Fisher versus Dover problem based on the <coughs> submitted request for a rehearing. And I think it's an unfortunate byproduct of the City Council's lack of uh, appointing additional board members that we end up in these situations where we've got these, like a two three split. And so it's not a clear and decisive answer one way or the other. And I don't think the applicant should suffer for that. It's putting, uh, it's putting applicants at a disadvantage. Uh, so it's my hope that the council will correct that and appoint additional board members. But in the meantime, I'm inclined to support the request for rehearing. Thank you. Any other? Just Dave. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, I got an opportunity, I was not at this meeting, but I got an opportunity to both review the uh, first time the applicant came before the, the board, the second time um, that both application packages, and then I did watch the meeting in question uh, and watch the section in regards to uh, the discussion about Fisher v. Dover for this particular application. Um, there, I, I do think there were a couple of irregularities there that I would be cautious about for the board, and I, I think the, the reason for really um, granting the applicant's request is that, um, first of all, the motion was to not invoke Fisher v. Dover, which is unusual. The usually, the, the assumption is, is Fisher v. Dover is something that only would be invoked by a motion of the board. Um, so that would be the normal motion. Um, as a result of that, some of the discussion kind of got skewed in sort of the opposite direction in terms of of why it didn't as, as opposed to why Fisher v. Dover should be invoked. Um, I do know there was comments from uh, Mr. Mannell um, about uh, their thoughts as, as well as um, uh, Mr. Lee as well. However, the, there was somewhat limited and then the deciding vote by the uh, acting chair at the time um, really was no real explanation as to why the feeling was that Fisher v. Dover should be invoked by the by the acting chair. So I, I think that um, there's if this were to go to to uh, a, a court decision, that the board could be vulnerable with not really having like a lot of detailed information as to um, some of the thoughts behind the Fisher v. Dover in, invocation. 
in, in my mind, to prevent that, um, I think the easiest way is for the board to go and grant the request for a rehearing. That rehearing could be a more detailed discussion about Fisher v. Dover, um, or it could decide that Fisher v. Dover didn't, didn't apply, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the applicant's new design is still not going to uh, fail, right? But it would give an opportunity for the applicant to fully understand all the board's concerns in regard to either issue um, should should the applicant not prevail in the follow on, following on meeting. So so my thought is is it's unusual. Normally we want the, the board's decisions to be final, but uh, as was noted, it was a five member board. There was um, some you know li limited participation. I, I think that it would be in the board's best interests from a legal standpoint to uh, to reconsider this at uh, the next meeting. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I'll go back to what I said originally, even though the size of the project has, has reduced. Um, none of the objections that we found with the original denial were changed. They're, they were all still in place. My objection to um, surrounding property values, somebody else's objection to uh, hardship. I remember a third person saying, well, that the entire project was inside the wetlands boundary. Nothing, none of those objections have changed with the new project. That's why I voted the way I voted. I think the, the standard for a motion for rehearing is whether or not we would like to correct our own errors or there's been a misapprehension or mistake of law or fact. Um, I was not at this hearing. I did watch the, the um, I was out sick. I did watch the tape on this. I believe that the board came to the right decision on this, that it was barred by Fisher v. Dover. So I will not be supporting a rehearing. Yeah, uh, Matt, thank you, Madam Chair. So just one other thing I forgot to mention. Um, it was sort of mentioned late by the applicant's attorney that the uh, criteria also potentially had changed from the original application where uh, there was 30 feet required. The applicant's um, representative indicated that through the averaging method that is allowed for the zoning ordinance that the actual requirement was 19 feet. Now, admittedly, that isn't technically a change in the zoning ordinance, but it is a change, a substantial change in the applicant's recognition of the relief necessary to be granted by the board. So again, the applicant changed their design and also, um, you know, had a different uh, standard or requirement for the actual relief that was necessary. And, and again, the board could simply decide that Fisher v. Dover is, is applicable, but I just think that uh, with the information that was provided at that hearing, that we would be better served to rehear it and, if necessary, re-decide whether or not Fisher v. Dover applies. Any other comments? Uh, I would, yeah, I would just add that uh, my position hasn't changed since the previous uh, and I, I would be interested in uh, voting in favor of rehearing, um, which isn't the same as approving the project. Just, just for no, the I yep. completely understand. Um, and my position has not changed either. I do not believe that we aired when we this when we um, discussed this the last time, and um, therefore I would not vote for a rehearing. If there are no more comments, I will be looking for a motion from somebody. Um, I will make a motion to deny the rehearing. Is there a second? Okay. Mr. Mano. Uh, as I've said before, um, I do not believe that the material changes would have would have altered the original decision or that decision. 
uh, because all the objections that the board members found with the application were still in play. And my, no, my second will just say that I don't believe that the board erred um, in reaching its decision. Okay. Is there discussion prior to a vote? Okay. Then we will call the question. Mr. Mantle. Motion to deny. The yes. motion is to deny. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. Mr. Ram. No. Mr. Rossi. No. Mr. Matson. No. And um, I will vote yes. Okay. So we have four three. Four three. We have four three. <clears throat> Okay. All right. So moving on to the next item of business. Sorry, I have, without my computer working, I am overwhelmed with paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our next item of business is the request of Nisley. LLC owner for property located at 915 Sagamore Avenue, whereas relief is needed to demolish the existing building and construct new mixed-use building, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.440 to allow a mixed-use building where residential and office uses are not permitted. Two, a variance from section 10.1113.2 to allow parking to be located in the front of the principal building. Three, a variance from section 10.1114.31 to allow two driveways on a lot where only one is allowed. Said property is located on assessor map 223, lot 31, and lies within the waterfront business district. I'm sorry, before you start, I just want to say the ground rules, which I have not said tonight. Um, each petitioner is allowed 15 minutes, and if you think you might need more than that, we ask that you ask prior to beginning your presentation. Each public speaker is allowed five minutes, whether in favor, against, or two for, or against. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, for the record, Attorney Derek Durbin. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I also have with me Corey Caldwell from TF Moran Engineering um, behind me, um, Brian Rodens as well, who's the architect uh, working on our project. Uh, so the property at 915 Sagamore Avenue, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, is just over an acre in size. Um, it does have approximately 270 feet of road frontage on Sagamore Avenue. Um, it's also accessed by a 25-foot wide right away um, that runs along um, right off of Sagamore Avenue and accesses the property to the rear. Um, you'll see that there are parking areas. There's a fairly significant one to the front of the property. Um, there's also a fairly significant one to the rear, the front being paved. I believe the rear is mostly uh, sort of gravel and dirt. Uh, the property does have a significant grade drop from Sagamore Avenue, if you look at it. Um, from east to west, um, and also from north to south um, towards Sagamore Creek. Uh, this, it's the southern portion of the property that actually drops down um, to the creek. Um, that part is heavily wooded. Um, it also is comprised of ledge, has a pretty steep drop off, as you'll see um, through several of the pictures that were submitted with the application. Uh, while the property is considered to be waterfront uh, by definition, uh, the Sagamore Creek is essentially inaccessible um, from the uh, higher uh, elevations of the property uh, due to the topography, the drop-off um, that goes down to the creek uh, on the southern side. Um, that, um, if you're familiar with the property, it's basically accessed, um, at least if, you, if it had um, regular access to the water, it's basically an inlet that um, off of Sagamore Creek that uh, makes it a waterfront property. It's not actually, um, it doesn't have linear frontage along what I think many of us would consider to be the creek itself. Um, so it, it is an interesting property in that respect. 
Um, there is a two-story uh, building on the property. Um, that um, building previously uh, served as business location for Portsmouth Scuba, still, I believe, has the signage on the front unless it's been taken down recently. Uh, there is a mooring and machine shop um, business located on the first floor of the building. Um, that's accessed for, by the rear parking. Um, there is, on the second floor of the building, some type of, uh, at least the people at the property told me, it's some type of forestry-related business. Um, that's accessed by the um, front uh, parking area. I wouldn't necessarily call the property a junkyard. Um, it's pretty close to it in its existing state. It's certainly an eyesore. Um, there are a lot of um, inoperable vehicles, equipment on the property, lobster traps, um, debris, other things just basically scattered throughout the property in its existing state. Um, I did include an aerial photo with the submission. Um, I'm not going to point to exactly which page that is in your packet because I don't recall. Um, but there is, along with the photographs that were submitted with the application, an aerial photograph that kind of depicts some of that debris so you can get a general sense if you haven't um, actually visited the property itself as to, to its existing state. Um, from a uh, zoning perspective, the property is uniquely situated. Um, I don't believe that you could necessarily define the surrounding area by one particular use. Um, I did um, include as Exhibit A to my narrative, um, I showed sort of the, the general zoning um, that surrounds this property. Um, it's a mixture of, of, of different zoning. Um, I won't get into all that specifically, but to the northeast and west, um, many of the properties are zoned for residential uses. To the south, uh, most of the properties are zoned for a business or a mixed use. Um, so it, it's, it, it is very uniquely situated in that respect. Obviously, there are some other waterfront business properties in that area, um, but as noted in the staff report, um, five of the eight uh, waterfront business zone properties uh, surrounding it are actually used for residential purposes. Um, before I get into some of the proposed improvements, I'd just like to allow Corey Caldwell um, an opportunity to just discuss some of the existing conditions of the property in a little more detail given um, the importance of that to, to this application and in our request before you. So if I could, um, we may need about two extra minutes, but I think we're going to be, I think we can keep this within the 15. I'll move through the criteria pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Zoning Board, Corey Cowell of TF Moran. Uh, the first thing we look at as civil engineers with looking at a site is what fits, um, what are the allowed uses. As Derek mentioned, the site's in it one acre in size, but it does contain a lot of wetlands. When I look at the allowed uses, they are a school, a municipally operated park, a marine related retail sales, a fish market, a fishing boat landing, a marina, a landside supporting facility for commercial research and development, a wireless telecommunication facility, and accessory uses allowed or indoor and outdoor storage. This site is too small for a school, a telecommunication facility adjacent to a residential neighborhood on the shores of Sagamore Creek uh, probably would not be too well received. So all of the other allowed uses require access to the water. This site does not provide access to the water as evidenced in the photos that uh, we handed out earlier. Um, second, the frontage on the creek as evidenced in the aerial photo in the staff packet shows that it's more of an inlet and it's really not on the shores of Sagamore Creek. This inlet is a small brook which derives from a culvert uh, which carries stormwater and wetland flow out to Sagamore Creek. Um, I've included these photos that demonstrate this and in the, in the packet I handed out, the first photo was taken this morning at about 10 a.m. Uh, this photo was taken from the top of the slope adjacent to the building. It's not at low water. There was still two and a half, almost three hours to go until we reached low water. So the photo in this that you're looking at, photo one, is on its way toward low water, but not quite there. The water recedes even further. The second photo, which was also taken this morning, shows mud flats, not enough water for boat access. And it also shows on the left, you can see that steep slope that leads up to Sagamore Road. That steep slope also 
uh, wraps around and leads up to the building. Uh, the third photo was taken in the same location as the second photo. It's just a 180 degree swing from that second photo. This photo demonstrates the Rock Creek bed, which terminates at that culvert. In the foreground is a residential house. So you can see the source of water, which, uh, which this creek is fed from, uh, which flows down eventually into uh, Sagamore Creek. The fourth photo in the packet was taken this fall. This shows our waterfront access at low water. You can see in that photo rocks, mud flats, not enough water to support a small boat. There's just not enough draw or draft, if you will, to get any type of boat other than a canoe or kayak up to this property. And lastly, in the fifth photo, uh, even if a boat, small boat, were to get access, if the water filled up enough, you can see from this photo that the bridge pilings impede boat access to the site. So as you're coming into this waterfront or going out, um, that those bridge pilings are right there, and uh, a boat would be difficult to maneuver around. I think you'll agree the photos demonstrate that the waterfront property is not suitable for a fish market, a fishing boat landing, a marina, or a landside support facility for commercial research and development. Barring these uses, we started looking at other potential uses for the property. Uh, the second site impairment to this property is its topography. The highest observable tide line in the photos at the water is approximately elevation four to five. The floor elevation of the existing building is at approximately 29. This leaves 25 feet vertical distance from the floor elevation to the water elevation. The slopes on portions of these properties exceed 60% from where that photo was taken down to the water's edge is approximately a 60% slope. To put that in perspective, the maximum grade allowed on new roads in Portsmouth is 6%. So this slope is 10 times greater than the maximum grade allowed for, for new roads. Third impairment to construction on this site is the 100-foot wetland buffer. Most of the property between the existing building and the water is in that 100-foot wetland buffer. As you can see from the colored plan in your packet and on the screen, everything between that building and the creek bed is essentially located in that buffer. The buffer is well vegetated. It serves a purpose it protects the creek. A waterfront business use would likely require altercation of this buffer to get that slope from the waterfront to the building 25 feet higher, more gentle. And we feel that altering the buffer to that extent does not serve well to this property. So because of these three factors, we maintain that the property does have special conditions that, that do distinguish it from some of the surrounding properties and it's not suited for any of the uses allowed in the Waterfront Business District. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, for the record, Attorney Derek Durbin on behalf of the applicant. Um, so I'll turn to some of the proposed improvements and go over them pretty briefly. I know you're well aware of them from the packet. Um, what we are proposing is a three-story mixed-use building. Um, the building would contain office space on all three floors and 12 residential units of approximately 780 square feet um, in size, so there would be four per floor. Um, each residential unit would have one uh, bedroom and one bathroom. Uh, most of the off-street parking spaces uh, would be located under to the rear of the proposed building, except for two ADA-compliant spaces that would be provided for in the front. Um, hence the need for one of the variance requests before you. Uh, the combination of residential units and office space um, in the building does obviously lend itself to a uh, future live-work environment, which I believe is hoped for. If the variances are granted, my client would need site plan and conditional use permit approvals from the planning board. Um, so there are several other hurdles to overcome if, if we get through uh, this evening. Um, the plans for the property do remain conceptual at the moment, um, given the various uh, approvals that are needed um, to redevelop it. Um, but what we're presenting tonight, we do believe is a realistic vision for what um, we're intending to do out there. Um, I did just want to point out very quickly that the um, variance is sought for parking in the front yard and for secondary driveway access relate to existing conditions of the property, uh, which we'll actually be improving upon. Turning the variance criteria, granting the variances will not be contrary to the public interest and will observe the spirit of the ordinance. 
the property is located uh, within a very small pocket of other properties that are zoned uh, waterfront business. Um, I already mentioned the staff memo and the note there, which um, indicates that five of the um, of those eight properties are used for residential purposes. The properties um, within the area are predominantly used for residential purposes in general. Um, um, and most of those um, properties, uh, at least the ones that are in the waterfront business district that um, are located on Sagamore Creek um, do actually have access to the creek, which uh, distinguish them from this property. Um, the uh, property directly across Sagamore Creek, I believe many of you are also familiar with, that is Seacoast um, Mental Health. Um, and their building, that's approximately a 20,000 square foot building. Um, per the receptionist that I spoke to um, there, there's uh, 50 plus offices within that building. Um, so you do have um, right across the street, a, I'm sorry, right across the creek, a, uh, a property that's um, used for office related purposes. Uh, my opinion of this is that the property is improperly zoned, but I understand likely why it was zoned that way to be consistent with the business <coughs> around it. The proposed mixed office residential use of the property is consistent um, with surrounding uses. Um, it'll create an opportunity for more, um, more uh, housing that's of a more affordable nature um, and obviously um, the potential for a future live work environment. Um, opportunities like that are obviously scarce in Portsmouth. Um, so I think it is incumbent upon the city uh, to create more opportunities like this. It is consistent with the public interest um, overall, the conditions of the property will be improved with the proposed redevelopment. For these reasons, granting the variance will not alter the essential character of the area. Um, certainly will not threaten public health, safety, and welfare with the, um, the property will be improved. Um, so um, also uh, turning to um, uh, the substantial justice criteria, um, because of the property is uh, how it is presently zoned, there are very limited uses that can be made of it. Uh, most of the uses, as Corey pointed out, that are permitted within waterfront business zoning are not feasible given the challenges associated with the property. Uh, granting the variances would allow the owner to make reasonable use of the property um, while maintaining consistency with the surrounding area. Um, in this case, the loss to the landowner outweighs any perceived gain to the public. Value surrounding properties will not be diminished by granting the variances. Uh, the property is obviously in a sort of derelict condition as it exists now, certainly an eyesore um, to anybody that's been out there or that's uh, familiar with the property, and I'm sure for the residential abutters. So any improvement um, and cleanup of the property should only increase surrounding property values. Um, I would submit to the board that the building's tastefully designed. Um, it's in keeping with the general um, prevailing character of the area and would be an aesthetic improvement over what exists now. Literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. Corey has already um, identified many of the special conditions of the property, so have I, but the topography um, makes it inconducive to most waterfront business permitted uses. Um, I don't need to discuss the, the, the challenges associated with accessing the creek. Those have been noted, but um, they are significant. They are real. Um, they do distinguish this property from other properties that surround it. The property is also quite a bit larger than most of the surrounding properties. However, it's almost entirely encumbered by wetland buffer, which also severely restricts what uses can be made of it. Uh, the property also uh, has two existing driveway access points, paved parking in the front. Um, those are conditions that exist uh, for which variances are sought, but which we will be improving upon. Even if the property could be used for a marine related purpose, um, I would submit to the board that it would likely be inconsistent, incompatible with those uses that surround it. Uh, so for these reasons, there is no fair and substantial relationship between the general purpose of the ordinance provisions and their application uh, to the property. I understand um, from appearing before this board for several years and having been on the board before that the board uh, is probably reluctant to give up variances very easily for waterfront business related um, zone properties, but um, this is certainly one of those instances um, where, and I think that that scrutiny is ultimately justified. I mean, there is a limited amount of waterfront in Portsmouth, but this is really one of those instances where it's it's waterfront in name only. Um, it, it really is not a, a 
what I think many of us would like to have as a waterfront property. Um, so for those reasons, I'd submit to the board that we meet the five criteria for granting each of the variants requested. And um, I hope you'll approve the application tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, Brian Rodentz is also here to answer any design-related questions, and obviously Corey related to any technical questions. Does anybody have any questions for the or <laughs> Attorney Durbin? No? Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Ruhan. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Attorney Durbin, um, well, I guess one of my questions is um, you included in your application a tax map, and um, Ms. Casella, I don't know if you can go yes. to page 191 of the BOA packet for uh, January 17th, I believe, would show it. Um, so one of your contentions is is that uh, your property is somewhat unfairly burdened by being in the waterfront business district because it its waterfront is not useful. That said, um, there are other properties that are truly landlocked, for example, 223-34, uh, 223-33, 223-26A, and 223-29, which have absolutely no access whatsoever to the waterfront and yet are considered part of the waterfront business district. So if those properties are were considered by the city council to be appropriate for uh, this district. Why do you feel that yours, I know you've kind of gone through some of the reasons, but in, in light of that additional piece of information, um, why do you feel that yours is still wrongly included in the waterfront business area? Yeah, sure, fair question. Um, so I, I tried to catch all those numbers as you were rattling them off, but- um, Yeah, they, I, just sort of the surrounding properties. Yeah, most of the surrounding properties that have been identified are used for residential purposes, um, the, particularly the, the, I believe the landlocked parcels that you referred to, um, in addition to actually um, at least one or two other properties which uh, have direct access on the Sagamore Creek. Um, so of that pocket, um, most of them are uh, used for residential purposes. I'm not quite sure what some of the other uses exactly have been identified with the other three of the eight. Um, maybe um, I, I know we have uh, Dave Garvey here who, who just arrived who is uh, affiliated with the property and could, it could potentially speak to that. But to answer your question, I believe, um, you know, this is a situation where that the zoning, I think it does probably fit with a couple of the properties, but it really doesn't fit with the majority of them. And I think uh, there is a Supreme Court case, Bellinger v. something, I can't remember. I cited to it in my narrative where the city really has an obligation to um, have the zoning reflect the prevailing character of the area. In this case, I think when you have five out of eight um, properties zoned waterfront business that are used for residential purposes, and that's not identifying what the other three are utilized for. I think it really the prevailing character is something other than waterfront business. That said, I can also understand the city's interest in trying to protect what little left it has of waterfront areas, particularly those that are accessible to water. Um, I, I, I can clearly sympathize with that and, and appreciate it. Um, so in your narrative, um, I don't think you touched on it as much uh, in your, your discussion tonight, but in your narrative you do talk about the fact that the existing property has become um, in poor condition, it has, um, you know, junk strewn around it. But w w let me understand, your client, the proposed developer, is currently the property owner and was has been for some time. Is that true or not true? Uh, no, that's, um, uh, my client is actually, um, so, the application was submitted on, on behalf of the owner of the property. However, my client, the, the one that is um, interested in this property, is actually a purchaser for the property. So it's not actually, um, it's not actually the owner of the property itself. Yeah. The owner of the property is not here tonight as far as I understand. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so you've, made a, you've commented a number of times, and it is also in your narrative that you provided the board about this idea of this could be a work-live um, office combination of office uh, residential combination of some sort. Um, but it, you used the word hope um, when you mm -hmm. talked about that. So what is your client doing uh, that would promote this uh, vision of a work-live office complex uh, come into light? Is there any work plans to make uh, any of these um, workforce housing 
uh, something else that will bind those residential units to the businesses that are located beneath them. Yeah, there, there's, so there's no plan to create workforce housing. I'm not going to mislead the board in that respect. Um, that There's absolutely um, no desire to, to, to do that on this site. However, um, I, I think um, ultimately the uh, plan is conceptual still. It's still being worked through exactly um, how those – how the residential units and the future office space is going to interact, and and ultimately, I think it, it you know, to to some degree, and in, in full transparency, it's a, it depends on sort of how the market um, prevails over the next year or so, um, how how that how those interrelate with one another. Um, the the units themselves are um, designed to be quite small. Um, they are designed as one bedroom, one bathroom. That's not going to um, changed um, that is the, the representation before the board um, which obviously um, is a lower price point Portsmouth's inherently expensive so our lower price points are not Rochester's lower price points or Summersworth but um, they will fall I think in that um, naturally speaking into a, a lower um, bracket in terms of, of what the rents are um, the hope is is that yes that people will occupy I, I we just don't know exactly if that dream will come to fruition or not i mean that's that's the honest truth okay and uh lastly just if i may i'm chair uh lastly your conceptual building plans just looking at those i mean it, it strikes me as being a building that could be anywhere in the city it could find itself easily in the, the industrial district in the lafayette road area um, I guess what attempts were made, if, if any, to try and be uh, honoring of the waterfront business district, i.e. creating something in the um, uh, industrial spaces that could still make it a, uh, you know, some kind of tie to a waterfront, one of the uh, allowable uses in the waterfront business or um, something, anything to sort of distinguish this and the fact that it is a unique property that you're asking for, uh, as you pointed out, pretty exceptional relief from the zoning ordinance for. Sure. Um, to answer as to any considerations behind the design itself, I would probably turn to Brian, but um, I, I do, um, I will say this, um, you know, I don't believe that there is a uniform design or appearance that we would uh, all identify with waterfront businesses um, just due to the very nature of them. Um, it, with a situation like this, um, as Corey pointed out, obviously we don't have the ability to have mar marine dependent uses in the traditional sense. Um, so you're not designing a building around that. Um, ultimately you would be designing a building then if you were to try to cater to the other waterfront business uses, which would be either retail in nature, well it would essentially be retail, um, if, you, if you count like a seafood market in, into that um, clothing or um, you had the, the scuba shop, which was able to function for some time there before it couldn't. Um, so I, I don't, I think this was designed to be um, sort of in keeping in terms of uh, the way that it, um, you know, obviously the property slopes down to the back, that it's, it's not too um, oppressive to the surrounding properties. Um, but I don't believe it was necessarily designed to cater towards like a fish market or, or that or a retail type of business on the ground floor. Um, but I could have Brian, if, if the board would like, speak to the, the considerations behind the current design, if you'd like. That would be helpful. Uh, no, I, I'm really just trying to get a sense overall. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's one of my main concerns, and so mm -hmm. I want to give you an opportunity to. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, there was, the, 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 I, I don't believe there was any. Um, just, just given the um, lack of demand um, associated with, with that type of space, I don't believe there was, um, I mean, there was consideration obviously given to, to retail on the bottom floor, but I don't believe that um, the market really um, dictates that that use would, would, would necessarily um, work over the long term there. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody else have questions? Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll now open the hearing to the public. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Anyone who'd like to speak in favor of the petition? 
Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the petition? Is there anyone who would like to speak to, for, or against this petition? Okay. Seeing no one rise, I'll close the public hearing. So, board. What would we like to do with this? Ms. Morgison. So I will um, say that I, this is a use variance, so it's a, a pretty hard bar. I do note that um, in this area, there are already areas that are zoned mixed residential office, mixed residential business. Um, and, uh, you know, I. I guess I am not in favor of this uh, petition because I, 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 with all due respect, I just, I don't find the arguments that compelling for such a substantial change in uh, use variance. I think that this is a property that does have access to the creek. I mean, maybe it's hard to get to, but it certainly has access, um, much more so than some of the other landlocked uh, uh, properties, lots that um, Mr. Rayum actually had, had pointed out. So I, you know, I, I think the city council is the one that really should be looking at whether or not this should be um, waterfront business, but I believe that given that it does have access to water, there are other uses that could be made with this. And the fact that there is nearby properties, I know they're not for sale, but the city council was very intentional in how they zone this. There's waterfront business and then just across the creek, there are uh, mixed residential office and mixed residential business. Um, but I, those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but I'll kind of think out loud is, uh, I guess the first point is I, I do agree in terms of uh, how useful this actually would be as, a, or how not useful it would be as a waterfront business and how these, uh, potential alternative mixed use uh, residential office is is feasible um, and even potentially desirable. Uh, but some concerns I have is it seems, and also what I'm struggling with is they're just asking that the variance is for a use uh, and um, there was no uh, lot area per dwelling for waterfront business. Uh, but if it were, this, this would be quite an aggressive uh, ask um, for that density. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think uh, the three stories from the Sagamore side, considering the, the other side would be basically be four stories, um, is, is a little bit aggressive, and that, that relates to the lot area um, per dwelling. Uh, but all of that combined would, would seem to uh, potentially put it out of character with the, the neighborhood. Um, but uh, the, I understand other boards would be uh, seeing this project um, but I guess I like the idea of a uh, the mixed use uh, there, but um, how to vote and how to allow that with that with, uh, while also limiting the uh, density. Okay. Those are just my thoughts for now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm kind of going back and forth, mainly because the property just behind it we granted variances to uh in june since um it was a residence even though it's in the waterfront district um do since there's no previous boa uh history on this um I mean, and Attorney Durbin may even know that. Do you know when Portsmouth Scuba went in there? Uh, looks like it's been there for about 25, 30 years um, is, is how long it existed. Okay. There. Yeah. I don't know when the zoning took place. I do know the previous business had nothing to do with the waterfront. It was a TV repair shop. So 
I'm sort of betwixt and between here. Also, as a side note, I, I would just add I'm surprised that uh, there was potentially so much opposition to the four single-family homes uh, just up the hill, and this would be 12 units where there's zero opposition. Um, it, it shouldn't affect our – it's just a comment I observed. Yes. <laughs> I'll just say yes. Yes. <laughs> but, Mr. Mannell, in 1995, the Board did grant a variance to process fish in the cellar of the space there. But in 1995, I don't think this was zoned waterfront business because I don't think that was a zone that we had. Okay. That would be my. Right. Because otherwise it would be allowed by right. Right. Yeah. You're right. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other comments? And, okay, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, as you can probably tell from my questioning, I, I have concerns about this application. I, I think Mr. Matson's point about the proposed density is certainly one aspect of it. Uh, I think the applicant is kind of hidden in the waterfront business district that they are proposing to have a pr very substantial uh, footprint um, structure. Um, you know, the waterfront business district, as has been pointed out, was created, um, uh, again, going to many different forums, um, charrettes and whatnot, where um, zoning was being discussed. One of the very common things that we heard in all of those forums was a desire for the city to maintain its waterfront business presence, that it added an aspect and a character to the city that was highly identifiable to, um, to what the city wanted to be for the future. So I, I do think that we need to tread very carefully, as the applicant's uh, representative even, even self-admits, um, with uh, what we allow in in those areas and, and try to be true to what the um, what the public was saying now that said um, the the city council and the planning board could go back and relook at um, you know its original decision to include this and not only this but there's actually also waterfront business on the opposite shore that again has some landlocked properties on the opposite side of route 1 a um, you know, the, the, the decision might be that that vision, while it was great when we came up with it, uh, as the applicant has pointed out, maybe just doesn't make sense anymore and that uh, <clears throat> these spaces should be opened up for other uses. But I'm reluctant to, to do that um, in this form with this board, um, especially with this particular application. I could maybe live with something that was less intense and also tried to somehow honor the waterfront business uh, district to, you know, put on your thinking caps, really do some brainstorming. Um, what are some potential, you know, research again is one of the, um, one of the aspects of it. So is there something that could be done in cooperation with something that the University of New Hampshire say might, might want to do to, to promote research? Uh, something to better honor what, what the original intent of this was. I just see a proposal that calls for a building that could be, as I point out, anywhere in the city and not necessarily one that is um, tied to, uh, to this particular property. Like the rest of you, I am also very torn. And I feel that in some ways, having residences in this location and office is more appropriate for the neighborhood than anything else. It reflects what's across the street. It reflects what's around it. Um, however, I am concerned about the number of units. And uh, therefore, I would probably have a hard time supporting this. Um, I did get a note here from Ms. Casella saying that if the board wishes, they can send the applicant to work with the staff on design. Now, I understand we do not have final say on design at all. But if it were possible to come back with something that would be more acceptable, it might be worth another step if you are interested. So this is a tough one because the neighborhood really it's hard to call it waterfront business, even though that's what it's designated. And I don't know, but I feel like the, the size of it makes it hard. 
I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Bain. I think Mrs. Marsden actually Marsden beat me, but it's, it's up to you. I didn't realize sure. how hard it was to sit here and not to look that way. <laughs> right, now I know what it was like sitting right, over right. there. So, but, uh, oh, sorry. Well, I, who, who do you want to go? Your choice. I will let Ms. Marsden go. So I think with all due respect to city staff, this is a, a use variance and uh, design is really not within the purview of this board. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how many other applicants would have the opportunity to work with city staff on things. I, I think we need to vote this application up or down. Yes. Mr. Ray. Okay, thank you. Um, interestingly, uh, I was actually thinking of just the opposite. Um, and, and I don't necessarily think it would be truly a design aspect, but I do think it could be give the applicant an opportunity to um, consider some of the board's comments in terms of the intensity of what is being proposed and trying in, in some ways to better tie it to waterfront business that may be possible, that may be impossible, I don't entirely know. Um, but I was, I, I, I would actually make a, a motion that we uh, table this application um, and give the applicant a period of time. Uh, we can tentatively make it to our next monthly meeting in, in February to, to take the board's considerations into effect um, and see if they want to reapply with something something different or, or perhaps not. But uh, we give them the opportunity to do so without prejudice so that Fisher v. Dover wouldn't, wouldn't apply if they, if they did come up with something different, it, they, there would be no concern with that. Just Mr. Matson, go. Yes. Yeah, so also, just uh, a question about uh, for clarification: uh, If this variance were denied, they could could, could they come back with asking for this uh, a, a variance for a use if the use was uh, slightly different? Very different. Okay. <laughs> or depending how. One I, I meaning, defines meaning, could they? Different. Yeah. Would this exclude? With this, yeah, uh, removing the possibility of having uh, work, uh, office residential. I mean, if they want you to put an aquarium there, that would be very different yeah. for us <laughs> to consider. But I'm, other than that, you know, we always get into the question of how different is different. Um, Ms. Morrison. So I, I would say I would not support any motion to that effect. I, 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 with all due respect, I just don't think it's up to this board to be helpful to any applicants um and <laughs> so i you know i don't mean that to sound harsh or anything like that but um i think that we need to vote on this application as presented and uh let the applicant either go back to the drawing board or go forward um i i, I just don't think that we should be in the business of of helping of helping applicants okay so, so madam chair i did make a motion i don't know if they'll yes. get, get a second or not but does somebody, would somebody like to second the, I, to, For tabling it, I, I would second that, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, yes, please it, speak to your motion. Okay, uh, so my, my motion again, I, and I understand that where Ms. Margeson is coming from, um, not something that we normally would, would want to do. At the same point in time, I do believe this is kind of an unusual set of circumstances. Um, I, I think if we denied it, that the applicant could potentially come back, but um, at the same point in time, I think that there's an opportunity here um, for something that's now that the applicant may understand the board's um, concerns better. Und agreed, don't want to ever turn this board into the Historic District Commission and have multiple rounds of uh, tweak this window and tweak that window. But I think this is a use variance. Denying a use variance sets the applicant up with a fairly high bar for Fisher v. Dover. I think that that at least in my mind, there could be a potential for some type of compromise. Not sure the applicant could actually even get there. Not sure that even if they came back with something that it would still be approved by this board. So it would really be the applicant's choice as to whether or not they want to put in the time and effort to, to try and get there or not. Um, but I, I'm personally willing to give them that, nice. that opportunity under these unusual set of circumstances. I think you should be allowed to decide your fate in this situation. What direction might you want to go in here? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the direction I know that we would like to go in is either um, if the board were inclined to have the application tabled or in the alternative to simply withdraw and allow for um, resubmission. Um, seems like the tabling option would um, give us the opportunity, however, to um, reconsider and potentially withdraw. Um, in the meantime, um, I, I would see that probably is a likely um, direction of how things would proceed simply because at the point that we begin to change 
um, too much of the substance of the application. I'm not sure what aspects of it may alter the relief being sought. I think it'll ultimately probably be the same because of uh, two of them are related to existing conditions, but I think it gives us more optionality. Um, and it's not, I, I don't feel like it's a situation where we're, um, uh, you know, given, I think historically the, um, at least in my experience, the board has done this on other, op other um, projects that are sort of of a more unique nature like this. I know everybody argues their project is unique, but I mean, this is a very different property than, <laughs> Many others in Portsmouth. So. I think we all recognize that it's a complex yeah. decision. Um, is there discussion on the motion, Mr. Mano? Can this is probably for Stephanie? Can the applicant at any time during the presentation make a request to withdraw? Yes. Actually, to that that point, Madam Chair. Um, the board rules and regulations were amended in 2019 to address this very situation. <laughs> and uh, it now says, during the meeting, an application may only be withdrawn by the applicant or the applicant's representative after the case has been read into the record, but prior to the board opening the public hearing on the application. So, so they no. are. No, okay. no one withdraw it. Okay. We, because we ran into this where an applicant would come before us, suddenly realize like it was a hostile situation, and say, oh, I'm withdrawing, and then come back later on. Oh, and we, yep. we wanted to preclude that. OK. So. If I could just add, uh, for please. my uh, my second uh, to table, uh, it's it, it's not out of an interest in allowing the applicant uh, a chance to, uh, to work with the city staff to redesign and whatnot. It's, it's specifically about uh, uh, this um if if we denied this uh request for a variance for the use uh the potential future uh application to it um and, and the chance for revision in, in, independent of uh so not playing favorites or anything okay mr Rayum, i'm just going to ask you to repeat your motion because there's been yeah so my motion <laughs> is to table this um this application for a period of till the till the next February meeting, um, at which time the board will take it back up again and uh, give the applicant an opportunity to amend the application based off of um, comments by board members. Okay, thank you. Ms. Oh, so I, um, I will just again state I think that's inappropriate. I think that this gives this applicant a benefit that other applicants don't get where they get to take the temperature of the board and decide to fashion an application that would be acceptable to us. I, I do not think this is appropriate for the Board of Adjustment. So I will not be supporting the motion. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take a vote. Mr. Mano. No. Mr. McDonald. A vote. A no vote is not to table. A no vote is not to table. And I shall vote yes. Okay. No. Ms. Margeson. Mr. Matson. Yes. Mr. Ray. I know tricky. I just shake it up. <laughs> uh, I, yes. Yes. And I am going to vote yes. And there, uh, it's four. a tie. No, four to what two. Is it? Oh, it's four. Yes. Four to two. It is four to two. Sorry, I forgot Mr. McDonald's vote. So this will be tabled till February. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I know. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. We are now in new business. Item A. The request of Sarah M. Garden, revocable trust owner for property located at 47 Howard Street, whereas relief is needed for the installation of a mechanical heat pump, which requires the following. One, variance from section 10.515.14 to allow an eight foot setback where 10 feet is required. 
Said property is located on Assessor's Map 103, Lot 84, and lies within the General Residence B and Historic District. Is there anyone to speak to this application? Hi, I'm Justin Zimitz, the uh, husband of Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for having me and reviewing my land use application. Um, I will speak to the original application that I uh, submitted first. Uh, that was primarily uh, to focus on the best location for the exterior heat pump. It outlines the narrative criteria for the requested variance, along with marked up exterior photos and a high level site plan. I did submit an addendum to the application late last week. So given the holiday I, yesterday, I can uh, understand if none of you have had a chance to review it. I will also apologize for addressing to the wrong chairperson and oh. noting the HDC <laughs> instead of VOA <laughs> in the header. Um, there are also a few nitpick typos, typos in there, but um, the reason I compiled and submitted this addendum is in a good faith effort to tell the story why the proposed location of the heat pump is, is the best location for it on our property. I also included 19 signatures of, uh, of support from my butters and neighbors for this application. Um, if it would help, I can give a brief summary of the addendum and walk through it, or is what? I would suggest you do whatever thing you think represents you best. Okay, and great. you have 15 so, minutes to do it, so go ahead. Great. So on the addendum, I um, have, I'm not going to read through word for word, but I have four exhibits, uh, photos, uh, marked up photos on that app, on that addendum. And the first exhibit, uh, exhibit one, uh, is a marked up site plan of our home. Um, and so with, with us choosing a place for this heat pump, as you can see, we're very constricted uh, with a you know, 229 year old home with um, our structure is on the property line in multiple locations. On the east side is not an option as if we put it there it would be on our neighbor's property. On the south side, our house is right on Howard Street, literally. And so that's not an option. So it really narrows it down to the west and north side. Um, on exhibit, exhibit, exhibit two, that focuses on the rear of the house. Uh, and they identified three locations on the rear of the house where we could possibly put it, A, B, and C. Uh, I'll start with uh, location, well, I'll note location C here on this plan. As you can see, we have uh, our uh, irrigation silcock or hose bib is located in that location as well as a mature hydrangea bush for privacy and beauty. We also have a, the gate through our fence is right at that location. So putting it here uh, would be a, a conflict of the existing uh, landscaping as well as our irrigation silcock. Um, exhibit three, which is in a, on page three, I built a mock-up of this heat pump and the location of the air discharge, air discharge fan on this and spray painted on it. I also placed my toddler son, who I surprisingly <laughs> was able to have him stand for two seconds to take this picture, um, in front of this location uh, to just kind of to demonstrate the, uh, basically the unwanting of having this air dis discharge fan right next to our path of egress to our back door. Um, I did forget to mention on exhibit two, we do have two back doors to the patio, double doors, um, which we regularly use for guests, pets, and ourselves. Um, and with exhibit, and I will note for location C, that's also part of the reason why we don't want in this location is given the air discharge fan in the path of travel into it, in and out of our backyard, that would essentially impede on that. Our design, our exhibit four on page four, which is the west side of the house, um, is not really feasible in regards to the conflicts of the bulkhead entry point to the basement. Behind the, air, the mature bushes, we do have a gas meter between the windows. And then we have our side entry door, which is the kind of bump out foyer there. Um, and in addition to that, it would require us to have exterior conduit run up the side of our house to serve the back uh, units, back heads of the bedroom and living room, which would be unsightly with given we're in a historic district. Um, the HDC did approve our location A, um, which uh, I'm here to 
essentially requests a variance for. Um, I believe I covered everything on it. Um, any questions? Mr. Ray. Um, yeah, just one question. A, first of all, compliments on this is probably the most sophisticated <laughs> analysis I think I've ever encountered in my 10 years on the board in regards to uh, placement of a um, of an air conditioning unit. And you almost got it. You have the adorable toddler, but you need the family dog in there as well yeah. to like, really <laughs> tug at the heartstrings. Uh, that said, the one thing about that photo uh, with uh, the, the toddler is yes. uh, that is a, a an, seemingly larger unit than what uh, we normally see for our application. So I just wonder, I didn't, looking through your application, and see what particular um, condenser unit you were expecting to put in there. But is, is it really quite as big as what you're yeah, so, laboriously uh, put together three-dimensional model? Yeah, so this is, this is essentially the, the cut sheet, which is on the original application. Yeah. The dimensions of it is uh, 41 and a half inches tall, 37 and a half inches wide. And the depth of it is uh, essentially 20 inches, given that you have a 15-inch unit and you do have to keep it off the house, essentially six inches for the airflow to go through it. So. OK, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, that wasn't a hand. Yes, Mr. McNeil. No, sorry. <clears throat> what are the uses of, of the heat, heat pump system going to be? Heat, just heating and cooling? It's primarily cooling, but it does uh, provide heating. So it, it can supplement and have us have more control and zoning in our house. Okay. Do you have, do you have any climate control systems similar to that now? We have, well, we have a, a forced hot, hot water boiler. Okay. Yeah. And that does, I'm going to guess, baseboard hot water heater? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we use, we utilize window units for AC. And we viewed this as a more efficient uh, mechanical system um, for the home. More efficient in terms of em energy? Energy uses, usage, yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, thank you. We'll open it to the public. Okay. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this petition? Well, no, you, you need to come up, please, and give your name and speak into. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, my name is Barbara Sobel. I'm at 58 Manning Street, and I support um, Justin's request. It's an eight foot setback. The variance would be from 10 feet to eight feet, and I don't think it would be. Um, it would not affect us, even though it's eight feet. We, are, we have a fence in between the properties, so I would not, we would not even see the unit. Um, so I'm in support of his request. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here who would like to speak against this petition? Opposition? Anyone who would like to speak to, for, or against? Okay. Public hearing is closed. I would like to move that we approve the, uh, I would like to make a motion that we approve the application as submitted. Second. Second. Is there a discussion? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the, the kid that got David. <laughs> I, I needed the dog, too. Is there any further discussion? I need the dog too, but okay. Well, it's big of you to overlook. Did you want me to <laughs> yes, go through my motion then? You. Okay. So, uh, granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, we've come across these variances quite often in the historic district, and I do not believe that the ordinance is designed to prevent the upgrade and modernization of HVAC units within the historic district, uh, and to do so requires this sort of a variance. Uh, so. I do believe that this particular application is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, the substantial justice is achieved because there is no loss to the public uh, that outweighs the benefit to, uh, to the applicant. Granting the variance would diminish the values of the surround would not diminish the values of the surrounding property, particularly uh, this is supported by, uh, support by the uh, advocacy of the abutters. Uh, and in particular, Ms. Sobel, who uh, is the directly affected abutter, 
uh, if there was going to be a loss of property value, she would be the one most acutely affected. And since she supports this application, I take that as solid evidence that there is no impact, negative impact on her property values. In terms of hardship of the property, uh, it is a very densely uh, packed in location. Uh, I think the applicant has done a very good job of reviewing all the alternatives. Uh, when I looked at it on paper, I thought perhaps there was a potential for uh, Site D, which is along the driveway, but looking at it uh, upon visual inspection of the property, uh, that would actually be detrimental to the neighborhood in terms of the overall appearance of that historic area. So. Uh, I do believe that that is a special condition that mitigates uh, toward uh, locating the uh, unit uh, within eight feet of the property line as as proposed. Thank you. Anything to add? Yes. Um, I, I'll just concentrate on a couple of, um, um, you know, granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. So that really this this setback is, is a recognition of the tight neighborhoods that we have here in Portsmouth. Um, than the potential noise making of uh, this type of uh, condenser equipment for air conditioning units. Um, in this particular case, uh, these these heat pump units, these Mitsubishi units, um, I have one in my house. You can barely hear the thing running. Um, they are a, a unusually quiet compared to many other um, AC units. So I so I think in that sense, really what we're looking for is is to not disturb closely closely set neighbors. There is it, it, this is a fairly tight neighborhood, but again. Eight feet versus ten feet, with how quiet this unit is, um, would would not really make a difference in terms of what the ordinance is really trying to get after here. And then in terms of special conditions, I think one additional thing is is that uh, the existing house does have, as the applicant has, has pointed out, um, um, exit ways through large um, door doors, sliding doors to the backyard, and in multiple locations that really make it such that there's no other feasible location to go and, and put this unit um, and not have it be visible to the public as as uh, Mr. Rossi pointed out with the with the option D. So, you know, recognizing that they kind of have to jog it over because of the presence of this door that's right there. They're really doing the best that they possibly can to uh, to meet uh, uh, and, and try and make this as, as, as good as possible. So with that, I support approving it. Okay. If there's no, yes, Mr. Uh, McDonald. I'm going to support approving it as well. <clears throat> and, the, and the reason why for me is that this is the, the best example um, that I've seen since I've been serving on the board here uh, for an unnecessary hardship that's avoidable. Uh, if, if we try to refuse this, then what we're going to want wind up with is an old, possibly outmoded, inefficient, ineffective system that places an unfair, um, unnecessary hardship on the applicant. And there is no downside for for the city. This is this is it's not. It's not like some, Ed, the whole city is being affected by this decision. It's real straightforward. So I'm going to support it. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further comments, we will vote. Mr. Mano. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. Mr. Rayan. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. And, yeah, Jeff, I can <laughs> Mr. Benson. Oh, yes. Sorry, I'll get there. <laughs> and the chair votes yes. You are approved. <laughs> Thank you. The next item of business is the request of Antonio Salima, trustee of Salima Realty Trust owner, for a property located at 199 Constitution Avenue, whereas relief is needed to build a climbing, yoga, and general and specialty fitness studio in an existing building, which requires the following. One, special exception exception from section 10.440 use number 4.42 to allow a health club, yoga studio, martial arts school, or similar use that is greater than 2,000 GFA. 
Said property is located on Assessor Map 285, Lot 16-301 and lies within the Industrial District. Is there someone to speak to this application? Hello, I am not Tony Salema. I'm uh, Taki Miyamoto, uh, owner of Salt Pump Portsmouth LLC. We will be, or we are the tenants of Tony Salema's property at 199 Constitution Ave. What are we, Salt Pump itself has an existing facility in Scarborough, Maine, is an indoor climbing facility, and this will be our second location that we'd like to open in Portsmouth. Um, and we are here to request that a special exception to use a portion of the property at 199 Constitution Ave, which is located in the industrial zoning district as a quote, health club, yoga studio, martial arts school, or similar use under section or 4.42 of Article 4, Section 10.440 of the City of Portsmouth Zoning Ordinance. Uh, we meet the requirements set forth in Sections 10.232.20 through 10.232.26 of the zoning, zoning ordinance as follows. Uh, as to 10.232.21, we meet the standards as provided by the ordinance for the particular use permitted by a special exception. We're leasing uh, 14,500 square feet of uh, an existing 18,000 square foot footprint building. Locate, there's two buildings on the property, what will, which one uh, will be located. We will be in the building that is close to Constitution Avenue. Uh, we'll be using it for climbing, yoga, and related fitness um, activities. We'll have, and the prior tenant of that space was Little Big Farm Foods. The original tenant was for, was, um, was Tony, and he, he used it to make Dunkin' Donuts donuts and other baked goods. Um, and when we started the lease, it was unoccupied at the time. And in addition to us, that same building has a tenant, one tenant uh, that has 4,000 square feet of warehouse and 2,000 square foot of office space. And I forgot to mention, I'm here with Brad Jones with Jones and Beach Engineers to answer any technical questions. Um, as to, and so in use number 4.40 in table 10.1112.321 of the zoning ordinance requires us to provide a minimum of 58 parking spaces. The other tenant requires eight spaces, so for 66 in total. And uh, we are, on in the site plan we're showing, we're showing 67 spaces. Um, so as to section 10.232.22, no hazard to the public or adjacent property on account of potential fire, explosion, or release of toxic materials. Similar to other health clubs, yoga studios, or similar uses, we will not be creating a hazard to the public or adjacent property on account of potential fire, explosion, or release of toxic materials. It's just not in our business operations. As to temp, section 10.23, 2.23, no detriment to property values in the vicinity or change in the central characteristic of any area, including residential neighborhoods or business and industrial districts on account of the location or scale of buildings and other structures, parking areas, access ways, odor, smoke, gas, dust, or other pollutant, noise, glare, heat, vibration, or unsightly outdoor storage or equipment, vehicles, or other materials. Uh, we will not be changing the location or scale of the buildings or other structures on the property not be changing parking areas or access, access ways. And similar to other health clubs, yoga studios, or similar uses, we do not create odor, smoke, gas, dust, or other pollutants, noise, glare, heat, vibration, or unsightly outdoor storage of equipment, vehicles, or other materials. As to section 10.232.24, no creation of a traffic safety hazard or substantial increase in the level of traffic congestion in the vicinity. Uh, we will not create a traffic safety hazard or substantial increase in the level of of traffic congestion in the vicinity. The property is located to the east of Banfield Road and west of Route 1 or Lafayette Road, a Walmart Supercenter, Viridian Residences, and the Portsmouth Green Shopping Mall, which contains similar fitness offerings, such as uh, for Pilates, cycling, bar classes, and other group fitness studios. As to section, <coughs> excuse me, 10.232.25, no excessive demand on municipal services, including but not limited to water, sewer, waste disposal, police and fire protection in schools. Uh, we should not be creating excess demand on municipal services. In fact, we expect there to be a decrease in some of those services, such as water, sewer, and waste, compared to our prior tenant's use. And as to section 10.232.26, no significant increase of stormwater runoff onto adjacent property or streets. We will not be changing the impervious surface area existing today on that property. 
Therefore, should, uh, our use should not result in any significant increase of stormwater runoff to adjacent property or streets. Um, and based on the foregoing, we respectfully request that our request for special exception be granted. Thank you. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Ray. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, looking at your proposed concept design, it's uh, page 221 of our packet. Uh, I'm just trying to get oriented um, to what we're looking at on, on that. Uh, it's your sheet A4. Uh, yep. So the first four new. Um, what is the, uh, uh, how are people going to enter your space? Um, and, and what's the orientation here? I'm, I'm a little used to understand how this the bottom of the page of A04 is what, oh. oh, sorry, trying to get okay. there. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, I was going to use the, the site plan you had, but the, basically if, if you're looking at the site plan and then if you're looking at this, the bottom of the page is, is north. Okay. So where the larger parking concentration is, is the, the front entry and the bottom of that page of A04. So the two-story area is closer to Walmart? Correct. Okay. Um, and is that anticipated? Uh, like, how are your customers coming into your space? They'll be Which door? either, they're coming in from either direction, I suppose is possible, but most likely from Constitution Avenue, turning into that road, which I'm not sure what its name is, and then, and then down into the building. Okay, so you have a new handicap spots that you're putting out in, on one side of the building, but not the other. So is that intended to be your primary entrance? Is that why the handicap spot is located there? The current, the current building as is has those two spots and a curb cuts to get into the building from there. So uh, if I'm answering your question right, yeah, as designed, our primary entrance will be in, will be on where the, bulk of the parking is, but we'll, there will also be entry, two entries actually on the, on the south side, uh -huh. Walmart side. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess my only concern there is just from a, from a customer confusion perspective, do you intend to, um, you know, we don't have anything here on signage, but do you intend to have something that's sort of pointing out like, hey, this is the way into, into this new mm -hmm. business that I'm creating. I hope so. I hope so in, in that, yes, I hope to avoid that confusion for sure. Okay. Yep. Um, would customers who are, so a, a number of the parking spots associated with your business are on the back side of the building. Is there an alternative entrance on the back side as well, or are you anticipating that customers will have to come all the way around to the front? The back side being? Being the north side away from the Walmart property. That, no, there'll be an entrance on that side too. Okay. Yep. All right, again, hopefully labeled as, all, right. as an entrance. Correct. Yep. Um, if I may continue, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, on your page 218 of our package, it's a drawing C1. There's a whole bunch of little squiggly graphics that are look like truck turn around and back up. Um, yep. Does that does that have anything to do with your business? I'm presuming that's entirely with the neighboring. I can answer this. Uh, Brad may be better to answer this, but the reason we did that our neighbor has a truck loading zone there, and, but we wanted to see if we can use that. Can I go over here? Uh, you have no. to yeah, the, bring the microphone. Okay. The microphone. The, you can the take parking. the microphone, take the microphone with you take, take if you would oh, take like. The, take this microphone. Yeah, if you want oh, to wow. get a microphone. Don't, just don't touch the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to get as many parking spaces in the back here, but we wanted to be conscious of this truck loading and pretend, they don't do much truck loading here, but if they can back out and back back out and get out of the space comfortably, and so that's why we, we included that the uh, okay. that study. Right. Don't want them hitting any of your customers' cars Correct. with uh, with the truck. Correct. Right. Um, so there's 58 parking spaces that are required by our ordinance for your business. Do you real? What do you anticipate is your typical customer? What I mean, do you even have enough activities for 58 people to be in your your business at one time? The short answer is we hope so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So your anticipation is is all of that parking is probably something that you'll ideally if you're if you're you're successful in your business plan you will need that parking. Correct. Have you done any kind of analysis on like trips per hour at all in terms of uh, the one criteria that we have related to traffic? We have not. Okay. Um, any sense of like how long you anticipate your customers being there? Like multiple hours? Hour and a half. It's probably on average. Okay. Our programs, are, so after school programs, youth programs, and adult programs typically run about 45 minutes to 50 minutes. So the programs, those people will be in and out in that time frame, and then people who are coming to just climb or to get a uh, workout in is an hour, hour and a half. Okay. All right. That's all I have for questions. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this petition? Anyone to speak in favor? Is there anyone in opposition to this petition? Is there anyone who would like to speak to, for, or against the petition? Okay. I'll close the public hearing. Board, Ms. Morgison. I would like to make a motion to approve the uh, application as presented and advertised. Second. Mr. Rossi seconds. Okay. So um, special exceptions, uh, if the applicant has demonstrated that they meet all of them, uh, the board is actually compelled to give uh, the special exceptions. So going through the criteria, uh, the review criteria, number one is standards as provided by this ordinance for the particular use permitted by a special exception. Uh, this is a, uh, the zoning ordinance allows for a business like this uh, to be located in an industrial zone. The special exception is to allow a health club, yoga studio, martial school, art school, or similar use that is greater than 2,000 um, square feet. So the, um, the uh, applicant's use is permitted by special exception in this zone, so it meets that criteria. The second section is 10.233.22. No hazard to the public or adjacent property on account of potential fire explosion or release of toxic materials. Uh, this is a um, yoga and general and specialty fitness studio and a climbing wall. Therefore, none of those uh, conditions will be present. Uh, it meets the criteria number three is section 0.232.23. No detriment to property values in the vicinity or change in the essential characteristics of any area, including residential neighborhoods or business and industrial districts on account of the location or scale of the buildings and other structures, parking areas, access ways, odor, smoke, gas, dust, or other pollutant, noise, glare, heat, vibration, or unsightly outdoor storage of equipment, vehicles, or other materials. Um, the applicant meets this criteria in that uh, this is an industrial area and the climbing uh, yoga and general special and, uh, special and general fitness studios will not have any outdoor uh, odor, smoke, gas, dust, or other pollutant, noise, glare, heat, vibration, and it will not have any out unsightly outdoor storage of equipment or vehicles. Um, number four, section 10.232.24, no creation of a traffic safety hazard or, hazard or a substantial increase in the level of tra traffic congestion in the vicinity. Um, as the applicant uh, was able to verify through the close questioning by member Rayum, um, they have taken into account all of the um, tr uh, turning radius and ways to keep, um, uh, ways to avoid having any kind of safety hazard. Also, as noted, this, this application does not need to go to TAC where such, uh, where such issues would be dealt with. Section 5, 10.232.25, no excessive demand on municipal services, including but not limited to water, sewer, waste disposal, police, and fire protection in schools. A climbing, uh, climbing studio, a, cl a facility that has climbing, yoga, and general and special fitness will not uh, create any excessive demand on any of those uh, services of the city. And section 10.232.26, no insignificant increase of stormwater runoff onto adjacent properties or streets. Um, this kind of use would not uh, create any kind of increase in stormwater runoff. And so for all those reasons, 
I move that we cr uh, grant this special exception. Do you have anything to? Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, with regard to 10.233.25, uh, sorry, 0.24 and traffic uh, congestion, Constitution Avenue is a very broad uh, throughway, and um, I can only wish that your business will be successful enough to create a traffic jam on Constitution Avenue. <laughs> it's never going to happen uh, because the avenue is so wide. So I see absolutely no problem with the with the uh, special use. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? If not, we will vote on the motion. Oh, I'm so sorry. I need <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I am somewhat torn. I guess I'm, I'm not quite as confident as uh, Mr. Rossi that, um, that this isn't a potential traffic headache. Um, that is a pretty far more intensive use of that space than uh, what is currently there. Um, it is kind of, um, I mean, the sort of the entryways onto Constitution and then, you know, people that may be trying to cut through the um, the Walmart parking lot, I'm not sure if they would, would in fact create um, a bit of a headache through those areas. Um, I'm, I'm kind of torn if it's, if it's worth it. I mean, you know, one thought I had was a, a potentially a stipulation that the Parking Traffic and Safety uh, Committee would need to take a look at this, although I don't like dumping stuff on other committees as well. Probably overkill, and I probably could live with the idea that um, that the applicant's business wouldn't negatively impact it. But I, I, I'm not as convinced it's cut and dry. So my thoughts. Okay. Thank you. Um, the chair feels that it meets all of the requirements for a special exception, and I will be supporting this. So, Mr. Mantle. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Morgison. Yes. Mr. Rayom. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Rossi. Yes. And Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So you are in business. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I get stuck in traffic going to Walmart. Call my Okay. Traffic. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the next item of business is item C under new business, and it is a request of Jesse M. Lynch and Sarah L. Lynch, owners for property located at 19 Sunset Road, whereas relief is needed to construct a connector structure from the primary structure to the garage, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.521 to allow A, 27 foot setback where 30 is required, and B, 22% building coverage where 20 is required. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming structure or building to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on assessor map 153, lot 19, and lies within the single residence B district. Is there anyone to speak to this petition? Yes, Madam Chair, my name is Arilda Dench. I'm prepared this application for Jessa, Jesse and Sarah Lynch and I'm here to speak to that today, and Sarah's also here with me. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna go through this briefly, um, looking at page S0, the first one. You can see their lot here, the little blue square at the corner of Boss and Sunset Roads, just off Aldridge near the um, Plaza 800. And I just wanna say that uh, Jesse and Sarah have spoken to all their neighbors and they've all given verbal support for this. Mark Batchelder, who's also a neighbor, wrote a letter of uh, email support to the city. So the neighbors are in favor of this small thing they will be requesting here. The next page is the existing lot and you can see here that they have a garage that's separated from their house and that's the issue. They want to connect these two. Um, all this site information is based on site plan and civil engineering plans done by Mark Batchelder in 2017 when we renovated the garage. Um, as you can see, the existing garage footprint is very close to the rear setback. It's only three foot seven in the front corner. Um, so that's the, the tight part that exists already. We won't be making that any worse. And I just wanted to point out the little dashed line that goes around the garage footprint, and that's an existing stormwater drainage system. 
that we will be tying into, and that goes directly into the catch basin out front. Um, so that's controlling stormwater really well right now, and we'll be tying into that so we won't be contributing any more runoff to the site or onto the street. Um, so the difficulty here is the minimum lot size for single residence B is 15,000 square feet, and um, the Lynches only have 7,754, so it's a tight lot. Uh, right now, the maximum structure cover allowed is 20%. Right now, they're at 20.3%. We want to increase that just slightly. We'll see that on the next page. Um, Another thing I wanted to show you was their official off-street parking is there at the existing driveway off Boss Avenue. But where they normally park is along Sunset Road. They just pull off to the side there because that's convenient to both of their, their entrances to the house. They rarely park in their designated parking or use the garage because of the separation. And so what happens is if they do park down there, then they have to walk up through the very steep side yard or in the street around the way, or they have to, um, I'll show you in the next street, next sheet, go through the garage, through the backyard, in a back door, through the basement, and then up into the house. And so, of course, they never use the garage, and that just didn't seem to make any sense. So we're going to try to fix that. Um, so if you go to your next sheet, that shows you what we're proposing here. And this is a very small addition, only 138 square feet, about 12 foot 8 wide in the front, and 6 foot 6 in the back there, 11 foot 3 approximately deep. Um, so this little connecting addition is sandwiched between these two existing structures, and it won't be very visible um, from the right or left, mostly visible from Boss Avenue. Um, and here you can see where we want to increase the maximum structure cover to 22.1%, so barely 2% more than what it is now. Uh, the minimum open space still, there's plenty of open space, plenty of pervious surface. Um, and here you can see how the little perimeter drains around the addition will tie into the existing. Um, and I also want to point out that the addition will not be any closer to any of the property boundaries. It will be, however, with a little piece of it will be within the 30-foot rear setback, but that's not any worse than what's already existing. Then if you go to your smaller sheets, the first one is the photographs. Um, Page A1.1 shows the Lynch residence. Uh, if you go to the upper right photo, you can see the corner of uh, where Sunset meets Boss Avenue. And you'll notice that where the garage is there in the background, it's actually about 13 feet lower grade level than the level of their um, grade in front of their front steps. So that's a big difference. And, just makes it so unworkable right now. So by connecting, it'll just make it a lot easier to get into the existing house. Um, and here you can see that this addition that will be sandwiched between the two buildings will be mainly visible from Boss Avenue here. Uh, right now, it's just unsafe and difficult to walk around, especially if the street's icy, um, just bad conditions as far as using their regular spot here in front of the garage. And if they park on Sunset, that's very steep where they park. So I've parked there myself. You get out of the car, and if it's icy, you've just got to really watch your step there. So we're just trying to make all that better, let them use their official parking. The next page has their immediate neighbors. The top two photos are um, across the street. 32 Boss Ave is across Boss Avenue from them, right at the intersection with Sunset Road. <coughs> the other one across Sunset Road, the, the brown house. And then the other two at the bottom are their immediate neighbors. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the neighborhood, and no one's right on top of them, which is nice. Uh, if you go to sheet A2.1, this shows you the existing conditions. 
You can see the, on the right I'm showing the second floor of the garage, which is almost at the grade level of the backyard and of the yard between the two buildings. Uh, and that little privacy fence will be removing that. And then I'll just go quickly to the next sheet to show you what we're proposing. At the bottom of the sheet, you can see the connector. So the idea is they'll park in front of their garage and then be able to, or, or inside the garage, and then be able to walk up that staircase and go right in through the connector and then up the staircase into their existing mudroom. So that will give them some really nice access there. It had a little bit of a complexity with the roof in that going up this, the new staircase that we're proposing, there's not a lot of headroom. So we're having to pop up the roof, which you'll see in the elevations, to give them enough headroom. And we want to keep it, the roof simple. So that meant we had to fill in the back corner of the garage there on the, on the second floor. It doesn't impact the footprint, but it's only a seven square foot of living space increase just to keep the roof line clean and have it make sense. Uh, going to the next sheet, you can see the view from Boss Avenue. Um, there's that connector in the middle there. We just kept the roof line as low as we could. So just bumping up enough to get the code headroom up the little stairway that you can see ghosted in there. Um, and here you can see that large grade drop between the two areas. And uh, I just wanted to make a note that this connecting addition will not be visible. If you're looking straight from Sunset Road, you can't see it because it's sort of tucked behind. Uh, going to the next sheet, this is the rear of the house, sort of looking up Boss Avenue. Uh, in this view, you can see the roof of the connector popping up. The garage is in the foreground. But I don't know how much that little roof will be visible because Boss Avenue is so much further down from there. I'm just sort of gives you a sense what's going on. There's that back door into the house where they'd have to walk in, with, where they walk in now if they want to go through the house. And then the last page shows the view kind of from their neighbor to the left, which just shows the little bit of the back of that connector, just a tiny thing. You can see that little corner infilled and the roof sitting on top of it. So pretty simple and straightforward. And then as far as the criteria, I've pretty much pointed out all these things, but I'll just briefly reiterate. Um, uh, 10.233.21 variance will not be contrary to the public interest. Because the addition is only 138 square feet, it's in a small area between the existing home and garage and has a low roof, and it's not closer to any setback lines than the existing structures. It should have very little impact, if any, on surrounding properties. New perimeter drains at the addition will tie into an existing stormwater system that was designed by licensed engineer Mark Batchelder and it's all in 2017. So no additional runoff onto the cider street will be created. Because of these points, granting a variance to build this connector will not be contrary to the public interest. And then point two two, the spirit of the ordinance will be observed. The building coverage will be over the maximum allowed by only 2%. And the minimum open space at the property at 66.8, where 40% minimum is allowed, allows for plenty of pervious surface and open space. In this way, and because of the previous reasons stated above, the request is reasonable and will not impact other properties, and so the spirit of the ordinance will be observed. With point two three, substantial justice will be done. The Lynches have a corner lot, and so um, the garage faces one way and then the house faces the other, which creates just a, um, a challenging situation with both entry doors facing Sunset Road and the dramatic grade change 13 feet between the two facades creates a problem. Um, as I said, <coughs> currently parking from the garage means navigating a steep hillside up to the entry doors, walking in the street, or walking up through the garage, through the backyard and basement. So the result is they still tend to park on the street in front of the house and the garage goes unused. 
Granting this variance will enable the Lynches to utilize their garage and their designated off-street parking much more safely and easily without impacting neighbors. Thereby, substantial justice will be done. Uh, point two four: the values of surrounding properties will not be diminished. Because of the points made above in point two one and point two two, the addition should have no impact on surrounding properties, and so the values of surrounding properties will not be dimin diminished. Uh, the style also of the connector just coordinates with the house so it fits in. And then lastly, point two five, that literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. So owing to the special conditions of the property, literal enforcement of the ordinance would create an unnecessary hardship. And these special conditions are that at 7,754 square feet, this lot is almost half the size of the minimum lot size for SRB of 15,000 square feet. So it's not easy to make any addition here without a variance. And also the dramatic change in grade level is quite unusual. Uh, between the house and garage, and so it makes it difficult to utilize the garage without a connector. Um, so we feel that these requests to connect the house and garage to make it more accessible and the walking safer is a reasonable one, and so therefore little enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship for the owners. And that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? <laughs> Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, first of all, the the um, connection between a main house and an outbuilding in New England, um, you know, is a pretty pretty common occurrence. Um, so much so that it actually gets its own Wikipedia entry if you look it up. Uh, the long history of creating the L. Um, so, in that sense, I think this application makes a lot of sense. My my concern is is five years ago your client came before this board. Um, seeking relief to reconstruct this garage. Uh, why is it that this um, seemingly pretty logical extension between the two pro the, the two main buildings not not included at that point in time? I'm not sure. Yes, you may. Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please. You have to introduce <laughs> yourself, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Lynch. I'm the owner. Um, so we. Before it was falling in, it was like tilted and it was a flat roof and we had three small children. So we put a fence up just so my kids couldn't get onto the roof and fall. It was very dangerous. And our neighbor actually said to us, as an engineer at the bus stop one day, he's like, you need to fix that or it's gonna fall in. Um, we weren't ready really financially or anything to do it, but we had to. Um, and the way it's built, it's three retaining walls. So it supports our whole property. And they were telling us it was gonna be $40,000 just insuring to build this so we had one builder come and tell us it wasn't possible so everything was just to build it then um, and not do another flat roof that would cave in so we weren't even thinking um, about attaching it because that was just financially kind of too much money and we also thought if there were stairs inside and you could go up and they go out the backyard and then go into her basement that that would work but we like rarely use our garage we visit it so I think we did what we could at the time. It was dangerous and had to be done then. And financially, we did what we could afford. And now, living with it, we realize. And so many people, neighbors walk by like, oh, you couldn't find a way to connect, connect it? Oh, you should have connected it. Like, we didn't do what we, what should have been done the first time. I think, you know, owners in the future would definitely want it connected to make the property, not that we're going anywhere, makes sense. Sure. A fair answer, and um, I guess towards that end, and, and the concern of the board is always that an applicant comes before us, says, hey, I want this thing, and then they come back a few years later, and like, well, you know, I want a little bit more of something, and then a few years later come back, I want a little more sure, something. Yeah. So towards that end, my other question is, I just want to make sure that this, you're being you know, forthright with the board. Um, you're putting in a three-quarter bath in the L, which yes. is kind of an, an a, odd spot it's backed up to a half bath that presumably all the people on the first floor your, your guests uh, when somebody from the residence is in the first floor would use that half bath what's the intention for this three-quarter bath and i guess the concern is 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 this something tied to a future plan for what is currently listed as storage over the garage or is there plans for a future bedroom there or even more significantly an accessory dwelling unit not definitely not an accessory dwelling unit the storage space um, may be used as a bedroom for a short time, but that's not the ultimate goal. 
Uh, currently, the house only has one bedroom or one bathroom that has a, a tub shower in it, and they have three girls. And so there's going to be a lot of showering. They're all hitting their teenage years. And um, so between the five of them, they felt they really needed another bathroom with a shower, and there just wasn't a good place to do it. We tried to squeeze it onto the second floor, but that seemed like an expensive build around for a situation that will be temporary because. Uh, one of the girls will get older and go to college before too long, so they just need it for a while. So Sarah and Jesse said they probably would use that storage space for a few years as a master bedroom so that the girls upstairs could have their own rooms. They, um, but then soon one will go to college and that won't be a concern anymore. But definitely not an ADU. Okay, so there is a good potential then that it will actually be uh, another bedroom for the, uh, for the house. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. So, is there anyone who would like to speak to this for in favor of this petition? Anyone to speak in favor? Is there anyone who would like to speak against this petition? Is there anyone who would like to speak to for? or against this petition. Seeing nobody rise, I will close the public hearing and open it to the board. I would just like to comment that uh, I will be supporting uh, this variance request. Uh, visual inspection of the property, I think that in the end it's going to be absolutely in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. It's a good upgrade. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. So. When someone's ready to make a motion, I'll be supporting it. Okay. The chair agrees with you completely. <laughs> Anybody? I made the last one. <laughs> Mr. Mano? <laughs> Excuse me? You to make a I've already made two motions. Did you want to do this one? Go ahead, uh, Jeff. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve um, as presented and advertised. Thank you. Is there a second for this motion? A second. A second. Okay. okay. All right. It's yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so going through the, uh, you know, I asked a couple questions. I think the uh, applicant uh, satisfactorily answered those questions in terms of uh, the intended use. Um, they are certainly. Uh, um, allowed to use the, the space as a bedroom. It did kind of. There is a reason why we ask for um, floor plans uh, when anyone's ever doing an addition to um, to a property, and this is this is one of the reasons why. So I'll just go through the criteria and um, some of the some of the salient points uh, and relevant facts related to them. So granting the variance would not be contrary uh, to the public interest. So the the, the public interest here, um, in terms of a slight increase in the uh, overall footprint of the of the property um, that's, that's being asked for building coverage from uh, just over 20 percent to a new 22 percent um, is, uh, is is extremely minimal the intent there is is not to create any kind of overcrowding this is really filling in uh, space between uh, two structures um, won't won't be impactful at all to uh, neighbors uh, abutters or the or the general public at at large. Um, our second criteria is um, sorry. Get my sheet out. Is uh, granting the variance would would observe the uh, the spirit of the ordinance. Um, again, this is a very very minimal impact that's being requested here to um, to what the ordinance is trying to accomplish. Um, through keeping light and air uh, between buildings, keeping open spaces, so the, the general appearance of a lack of crowdedness, especially in these uh, single residence zones. Um, so with that, um, this, this again is infill between two buildings, it's very minor increase in, in, um, in overall um, density on the property, and then the slight uh, impact to the setback requirement. Again, no one would even notice, it's really not, uh, not there's already other 
portions of the building that are far closer to the edges of the lot. Substantial justice would be done. That's against a, bal a balancing test between uh, what the applicant is trying to do and what the public interest is. I think the applicant um, clearly wins that, that balancing test. They're asking for very, very minimal relief um, that provides a lot of benefit to them in terms of connecting this um, odd garage uh, with their with their main house, uh, securing it from the winter, and also allowing an extra bathroom to be created in a in a challengingly small home with a uh, with a decent sized family in it. Um, really, the public has no outweighing um, concerns that would that would um, say that what the um, applicant is looking for is is unjust. Uh, value of, of surrounding properties will not be diminished. Again, very minor uh, change. Really, does not not affects the characteristics of the neighborhood. Um, no impact to um, value surrounding properties. And then uh, unnecessary hardship. So I think the applicant has made a, a good um, argument, as they did before during their original request to this board for relief, that, uh, that the unique topography of uh, their lot, um, where a garage had been built many years ago, they re sort of reconstructed that, as the applicant indicated. Uh, potentially a lot of structural work there. Um, something that, that no homeowner ever wants to wants to hear about uh, about their property, but they they were able to uh, remedy that situation, uh, recreate the garage, and now are doing a a logical connection between the two of them. That, as the applicant indicated, they probably would have done at the time had they thought a little bit more about, about the project and felt that they were in a position to do so um, f um, financially. So, um, with that, I, I think that is a, a hardship. Is is the topography of the, uh, the building? It's a reasonable request of uh, of connecting these two structures, long history of it in uh, New England architecture, and uh, they are now contributing to that uh, long history. So, with that, I recommend approval. Do you have anything uh, to add? Yeah, I'll just add that for uh, the variance not being contrary to the public interest, um, the the good faith measure to address stormwater management as well. Sure. Okay. Is there any discussion before we vote? If not, then I will start with Mr. Mannell. And the motion is to approve. The motion is to approve. Yes. And Mr. McDonald. Yes. And Ms. Morgison. Yes. And Mr. Rayum. Yes. And Mr. Rossi. Yes. And Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair also votes yes. You are approved. <laughs> Thank you. So we have just one more petition, but normally at this time we decide if we're going to take a five-minute break. Would the board like to do that or just power through for one more petition? I would like to take a break. Okay. We'll be back in five. Well, I mean, <laughs> seven. <only> one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was going to power through even though I had my, my uh, soda, but I, I would appreciate a break if okay. you're willing to give us one. So we apologize. Quick. Yeah, very quick. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, we are resuming our meeting, and the next item of business is the request of Patrick and Nicole Mullally, 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 Thanks. owners for property located at 36 Hunters Hill Avenue, whereas relief is needed to construct an addition with a second living unit, which requires the following. One, variance from section 10.440 use number 1.30 to allow a two-family dwelling unit in the business district. Two, variance from section 10.531 to allow a five-foot setback where 10 feet is required. Said property is located on Assessor Map 160, Lot 38, and lies within the Business B District. It's all yours. How are you doing? Good. I'm Patrick Mullally, uh, my wife Nicole, we're property owners. We are requesting variance on our property so we can tear down our existing non-attached garage and create a new attached garage with a living unit above it for my mother. My mother is older. I have her name, her age down, but this is televised. I won't <laughs> say it. <clears throat> she lives alone, and we are attempting to get her closer for various reasons. Uh, we tried looking for her houses in the area, and that's a near impossibility. So <clears throat> our current home is not really set up in a way where we could set it up to do that, where she would have her privacy. And this is our attempt at fixing that. Our home was built in the 20s and in the 30s. It was moved from one side of our garage to the other for the bypass to be put in. This is how or why our property currently does not meet the setback guidelines. This home has been in our family since it was built. Uh, my grandparents lived there with my father. We are hoping to be able to stay in this home. <clears throat> we would like to have my mother closer so she can be with her grandkids and so we don't have to worry about her living alone. The current garage is about eight feet from the property line and the proposed garage would be roughly six feet from the property line, so not a huge difference. Um, and it also from that corner will taper away from the property line. Uh, the only side that will be affected <clears throat> is the bypass as well as we are well within our other setbacks. Um, we get no intentions of actually renting this. This is literally going to be a mother-in-law apartment and who knows, our kids may wind up in there afterwards. <clears throat> we want to uh, project project to look nice and keep the feel of the neighborhood, which I think the proposed plans, it does. The garage addition will give the city a additional tax revenue from me. It will <clears throat> make our home more welcoming for my mother. Cool criteria. Uh, the request is consistent with the character of the neighborhood as the addition would be only creating a garage addition and would look within the character of the surrounding neighbors. The change does not impact any neighboring properties with sight lines or encroachments as a setback issue. It's only <coughs> issue, the only direct abut of the property line in question is the Route 1 bypass. <clears throat> there are many two-family homes in the surrounding neighborhood and we have plenty of parking on our property and the additional car will be in the garage whenever they are anyhow. <clears throat> the required setback cannot be achieved as we are currently over that setback and the proposed plans stays very close to that same footprint on that side. Even though it will be considered a two fam family, it will look very similar to the way it does not with just an attached garage and living space for my elderly mother. The issue of the setbacks from the bypass shouldn't be a huge issue, I'm hoping, as our home was moved in the 30s to allow the bypass to be put there in the first place. <clears throat> and our garage was never moved. Um, a moderate change to the existing structure allows for our mother to move closer for us to be able to stay in Portsmouth. <clears throat> uh, and granting the variance will add tax revenue to the city. <clears throat> Direct abutters include two one family homes and the two family home, home with attached studio apartment, <clears throat> and Route 1 bypass and a gas station. Extended neighbors include several commercial buildings like gas stations, gun exchange. <clears throat> Uh, no expected detriment to any of those surrounding properties is expected. Uh, there is no way for us to achieve the setback as our current garage is already non-compliant. If we are unable to get the uh, approvals, we're just going to have to get back to the drawing board, I guess. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Does anybody have questions? No, go ahead. Go, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, really, just 
I want to validate with you that the intent, though, is that the current garage will be torn down and that this new structure will be put in its place. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. But the main house, it's really just simply an add-on to the back of the main house. The main house is otherwise largely on a, unaffected. I mean, it yes. looks like there in might fact, be some appearance issues. But. I a little bit. They have to change roofs so that on the uh, very back okay. where it will be attached. Okay. Does your mother still drive? Is oh, yeah. So this She's is very independent. Um, having her live in our house with us now, I don't believe she would be happy with. She likes her space and likes to go when she wants to go. And it's just more she'd feel better if she were closer to us. Yeah. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, are you, are you finished? I'm sorry, Mr. Rossi. I'm finished for now. I okay. have some things I want to discuss when we're. Okay. I, I, oh. Yes, please. Fine, I'll. Go ahead. I need eyes and back. I know. <laughs> so this is not another garage. Well, there will be there's a garage a garage underneath and a living space up yeah, above. Oh. Okay. All right. That's that's what I thought. All right. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Ray. So I actually have a question for city staff on this so if I could. So the advertised relief that uh, the chair just read into the into the um, record is that it's a five foot setback right. where ten feet is required. But I believe it, and per your table and per the zoning ordinance, it's actually 15 feet. Um, any concerns with that? I'm presuming that's the way it was also advertised. Sorry, can you say that again? So it's it right. says, oh, yeah, five feet where 15 is. Minimum. Right. Uh, well, my the packet I'm looking at, page 242, and as was read by the um, by the chair, is a variance from section 10.531 to allow a five foot setback right. where 10 feet is required. But it's actually a 15 foot setback in this. In this I zone. believe it is 15 feet, and where that would be less. Yeah. So, so my concern is is with the advertisement of this, uh, with that verbiage um, not being quite correct. Um, just interested if uh, I guess something we need to decide if that's a de minimis um, if it is in fact an error whether or not it's a de minimis error or not it is 15 it is yeah so it's it is 15, it is 15. Um, I believe it is okay to move forward as long as it's stated and there is a stipulation that says, you know, it's a five foot where 15 is required. Okay. Um, should the board decide that that is not what they would like to do, um, the alternative would be to re-advertise. Okay, thank you. So it's on the agenda, it's 10 feet. It was, and it was, this is how it was advertised. Right. Correct. Okay. But in our details, it is. In, in the ordinance, in the it ordinance. is 15 feet. Yep, the advertisement should have said 15 feet. Mr. Rossi. Yeah, this is, a, uh, I guess since we're interacting with city staff right now, this is really a question for my own education, uh, and that is why is this, I mean, is this being considered as an, ac an attached accessory dwelling unit? Is that what we're looking at here? No. no. Not, and why is it not that? Business sure, district. and I can speak to that. So, um, neither an accessory dwelling unit or a two unit is allowed in this district. That's, that's um, honest, yeah. the reasoning um, of city staff was that more than two units is allowed. Um, I believe it's three to four is allowed. So this would be by having it be two units rather than an accessory dwelling unit. Um, it would be more in conformance with what is allowed in the district okay. or closer. So that's more that's closer, why it's put that way. I mean, yes. And point of fact, one unit is also not allowed to correct. Correct. So it's currently non conforming in that regard. Existing non conforming. By, uh, by, and by putting history. it this way, <laughs> then it's moving closer to conformance. You can say, one could say. <laughs> that is an interpretation. <laughs> yeah. But I guess what I mean, the real intention for the ordinance is to encourage uh, higher density uh, development in, in that business uh, dis zoned district, yeah. which yeah. this is not doing. Okay. 
Mm. Interesting. Ms. Marchison. I don't know if I thought. No. Okay. So sort of piggybacking on that a little bit and what uh, in the staff memo, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Stephanie, okay. but, um, and this was a question that I had. In the staff memo, it said that, um, just looking at it, hire, okay, so fam two family units are not permitted, but higher density residential uses, including three, four family units, is permitted by right. Right. Yeah. The weirdest thing. Mm. So they're looking for apartment buildings in this zone. Basically. So you, that's yeah. what, because apartment buildings are commercial uses; they're not residential uses. Mm. Mm. Unless Generally. it's a four family. I think that's how they're taxed. But apartment um, buildings are commercial. They're commercial. Right. So I guess I was going by the table under the table of uses. It's three and four is mm -hmm. under the residential section. Right. Um, but yes, I agree. It's all commercial use in other respects. Okay, so just a follow up question. Yeah. I haven't exactly followed the land use board that the land use committee that well, but the um, I think that they are going to make detached accessory dwelling units by right. In it would it be in the business district? Uh, you, and you may not know that. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't believe they've fully vetted that. Um, and it's my understanding that it's not going to be allowed by right. By right. Oh, really? Um, as at least as it's drafted in current form. Okay. All right. Thank you. So why don't we move ahead with this as it is? And I would consider this five foot error something that we could live with, unless I hear differently, um, Mr. Mantle. Can we? Um save the discussion until after the public hearing? Good idea. Okay. Thank no you. more questions? Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak to, for, or against this petition? Good evening. My name is John Hollowell. I abut the Mill on 361 Dennett Street, and I urge the committee to approve this variance. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak to in favor of this petition? There we go. Hello, my name is Tony Coviello. I live at 341 Dennis Street. I, too, abut the Malalis, and uh, we have no qualms about their intentions or this um, addition. I do have um, a lot of qualms about the zoning that is currently allowed on this property, and, and what I just heard from this board, I would say it would be an entirely inappropriate for to have a four unit apartment at this. If you were, I don't know if you did a site walk, this, this street is about 10 feet higher than Route 1 at the end. There's no way you could have access to Route 1. When David Holden was uh, the chair of the department and I was on the planning board, I, I felt inappropriate because I was a butter to suggest this, but this is entirely zoned improperly. And, it, and my comments have really nothing to do with Patrick and Nicole's application, but um, I fear that somebody's going to, you know, take these properties and try to do something like that. Now the current residents are both. There's only two of them. This is a, you know, short street. It's got four driveways on it. The two that abut the Route One bypass are currently zoned business, and um, I'm hoping there's some direction this board can provide to the planning department staff to look at rezoning these properties. But again, I want none, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bigger fall to Route 1 from the height of this platform, by the way. Um, I want none of that to, to affect the application, but um, I don't know if there's some way to document that or put it as, as part of a, a condition on this, but it's, just, um, it's a fearful thing to me, to us in the neighborhood who, like the Malalis, have no plan to, to leave to have the chance that these two properties could have something like that happen. But thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else to speak in favor of this petition? Is there anyone to speak against this petition? Is there anyone to speak to for or against this petition? If not, I'll close the public hearing and we can continue with our discussion. Yes, I would just like to clarify that uh, I was merely trying to understand what the zoning ordinance yeah. as written you know, allows and doesn't allow. I'm certainly not suggesting that someone build it out to the maximum you know, I, I have no opinion about that at all. The minutes will reflect that. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to um, um, approve the requested variances as presented and advertised with the stipulation that the board recognizes the de minimis error in uh, the advertisement for this, um, this application of 10 feet versus 15 feet. Okay, is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Okay. Please, yes. All right, thank you. Um, so this is kind of an interesting application. I think it's got a lot of um, little little quirks to it. Uh, you know, when the Route 1 bypass was created back circa 1940, as the applicant pointed out, there was quite a bit of disruption to uh, a number of the streets in this uh, neighborhood. Uh, Myrtle Avenue was cut in two, so they now have Kane Street on one side, Myrtle Avenue on the opposite side. Uh, cut Street was uh, cut in two. And then also, as was indicated by the applicant, uh, this their property was also adversely affected by this uh, this decision to create a, a drive around for uh, for the downtown, which we all appreciate today, uh, but uh, was was disruptive. So we appreciate the uh, sacrifices that were made by our our forefathers. Um, there's also kind of the as has was indicated uh, by um, Speaker Caviello and and. Um, the applicant, uh, it is kind of unusual that this is zoned business. Uh, there is a pretty substantial elevation difference between this property and the one directly across the street from it on, um, on uh, Hunters Hill Avenue. And, um, and, and really, it's probably not realistic that they would be uh, turned into businesses. They certainly, at the height of when there would have been a, some kind of desire to go and do that, uh, back circa the 1950s and 60s when the Route 1 bypass essentially carried all the traffic uh, from the New Hampshire Turnpike across into Maine. Uh, so you had a lot of traffic going across and paying 10 cents on the uh, on the previous uh, Sarah Mildred Long Bridge. Um, the, you had, you know, would have been the time when somebody would have, you know, bought these properties out, demolished them, and put in gas stations to compete with all the other gas stations uh, uh, along the route that they took advantage of uh, all that traffic going by. That didn't happen. Um, so realistically, what we're left with today is is probably not not a true business use for what would would have been anticipated by the drafters of the of the um, zoning ordinance, but rather, as has been pointed out, perhaps a more uh, notorious use of of creating a large building that would have uh, multiple units in it, which would actually be allowed by right. So. Something that probably needs to be fixed. I'm not sure if this board is one to tell another board what to do. I, I sense that the reason why it's a business district is simply to connect the other obvious business properties along the Route 1 bypass to the rest of the business district that continues a little ways up uh, on the bypass to reflect the, the next gas station that's there. And then is also reflected by the businesses that are on the opposite side of the um, of the Route 1 bypass. So, you know, you need to kind of create contiguous um, Zoning, you can't just separate off uh, just a couple of properties and create spot zoning. Wouldn't want to get accused of that. So I think that's the reason why this was done. Um, but with that, I, I do think that it is, it is reflective of the fact that this property is probably not in the correct zone. It really should be in the GRA zone, uh, similar to the, all the other properties in the immediate but, abutting area. Um, so that said, the applicant, even if they were in GRA, would not be fully compliant. Um, GRA does require the 10-foot setback that was advertised rather than the 15-foot um, required by the business. But I think the, the, the difference is still, still the same, that uh, realistically what the applicant is asking for here is simply some relief to put a similar size structure to one that already exists with, yes, a little bit higher so that there is essentially a, an apartment slash accessory dwelling unit, whatever we'd eventually call it. But the fundamental point is, is it is a second unit which is what an ADU is. An ADU is just a, a special second unit that is allowed by law in the state of New Hampshire, especially for single residence districts, which this is not a single residence district. It's a, it's a business district. So I think it's kind of six of one half dozen the, the other, whatever we want to call it. It just does recognize that there will be this separate independent living unit that for the current moment, the applicant has indicated will be for a family member. It could be for something else in the future, but I don't think in either way it would be uh, detrimental to the characteristics of the, uh, of the surrounding area. So just to go through the um, variance evaluation, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. Again, I think the public interest here is in uh, kind of this sort of zoning connection um, that is, is probably not really, shouldn't, shouldn't negatively affect the ability of this residential use or, or existing nonconformity 
in the um, in the business district from being slightly expanded from one dwelling unit to another. Um, it is probably the public's interest again is so that the that this property could remain in the hands of the of the current owners and not be necessarily transferred to some other owner who would then try and take more advantage of the uh, of the allowances in the business district and perhaps uh, provide something that would actually be negative to the public interest um, as, as expressed by the uh, some of the neighbors who have spoken here tonight. Um, Granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. So again, it's relatively small amount of uh, relief that's being asked for. Um, a little bit bigger because it's business district, but if it was more correctly zoned as the general residence A would be about 50%. The reason why we do that is for light and air up against the budding properties. In this case, it is up against the Route 1 bypass. It is, there's, there's no impact on light and air in that circumstances. And in, and in fact, the elevation difference also between this property and the Route 1 bypass further negates that as a concern. Uh, granting the variance would do substantial justice. Again, the public's interest in uh, not only uh, allowing the applicant to do what they're asking for, but um, in, in keeping it from maybe uh, being rebuilt in some other fashion um, is actually tips that balancing scale in, in the um, favor of the applicant. Granting the variance not to diminish the values of surrounding properties. I don't think any of the businesses that are at uh, the lower elevation would be negatively impacted by, by this. There's um, no impact to neighboring properties because, again, this is all on the opposite side of the other residential properties that uh, could potentially be impacted, so I don't see any issue there. And then uh, what is the unique hardship of this property? Again, um, as the applicant indicated, um, their current situation was actually set up by something that was imposed upon the property uh, back circa 1940 when, uh, when a public roadway was built and, uh, and their property was reoriented and removed, uh, elements moved around on it. Um, they are not really creating any worse of a encroachment than, than what, is, what is currently there. It is somewhat more elevated in height, but not excessively so or in such a way that it would be uh, detrimental to, um, it, it becomes a reasonable use of the property. And then, uh, you know, this elevation change between it and the Route 1 bypass really creates this, the, the situation that, um, you know, a more normal business use of this property is extremely unlikely. Um, and, and probably not logical for the way that this property is accessed through Hunter um, Hill Avenue. So uh, therefore, with those hardships, I believe it's a reasonable use. There is there is unique characteristics of the property. And with all that, I recommend approval with the noted stipulation. Thank you. Does the second have anything to add? Um. I would just add that it is interesting that uh, instead of being an unusual lot shape, it is uh, an unusual uh, zoning situation that yes. has led to this uh, hardship. So um, I second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Marchison. I would say normally, you know, the, the dwelling, the, the amount of dwellings on the lot is something that um, I take very seriously because the, the um, the city is usually very intentional about that. Um, however, in this instance, it's very hard to square with the fact, I recognize that these multifamily dwellings are commercial buildings generally, um, apartment buildings perhaps, but uh, I, I do find the way that I view it this very hard to square given the fact that the zoning does seem to be a little bit off on this. this a little. This area, <laughs> and uh, generally, if the zoning's a little bit off, I generally give the benefit to the applicant. So <laughs> I will be supporting it. <laughs> Any further comments? Just thought I would ask Beth to uh, just clarify that in juxtaposition to the discussion uh, that I recused myself from on 915 Sagamore, where the applicant also made the case that it was improperly zoned uh, for that parcel. So why is this case different from that case? Well, we finished the public hearing on that case, so I'm not going to discuss that case now. Um, so that's, and every application is different. So that is a very different application. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be a tad more daring, I guess. I mean, uh, you know, I also think that the uh, intensity of use and some of the the waterfront business district, again, this is business versus waterfront business. Um, I haven't seen the passion out of um, speakers at various, um, uh, you know, zoning uh, events that I've gone to, uh, charrettes and whatnot. 
Um, there's, there's not quite the passion for all the gas stations along the Route 1 bypass that there is for this sense of preserving some element of the city of Portsmouth that could easily go away if we let our waterfront areas be converted into other uses. So, so I, I do think that's a, a mitigating factor as well. Thank you for and commenting we on that. We don't really set precedents either. Each property it, is, it, is different. Each is unique. Yep. I, mean, we, I do, and I think most of us try to be consistent, but also a point of order that we're not discussing 915 Sagamore Avenue. We're discussing this application. So if there is no further discussion, I will call the vote. Mr. Mannell? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Ms. Margerson? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. And Mr. Matson? Yes. And the chair votes aye as well. So your mother is welcome. <laughs> Madam Chairman, make yes. a motion to adjourn. Can I just ask something first? Sure. No, not of them, but for no. next week, we'll be, listen we'll be hearing the rest of the applications. Uh, e through I. E through I. Yes. And there are no continuances or postponements on any of those or that we know of at this time? Not at this time. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. So yeah. didn't mean to interrupt the motion. <laughs> and, and 635 wouldn't get added to next week. It would have to be the next March month. March 21st. No, it, would, it would be March moved to, yeah. yeah. Motion to adjourn. Yes, if no one has any other business, then I will accept a motion to adjourn. Is second. there a second? Okay, all in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you.